Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. This week's report, as well as next week's U.S. Farm Report, will deal with this subject, NFO's Cattle Bargaining Program. So it is only natural today that I should have here as my special guest, Mr. Gene Potter, who is director of the Meat Commodity Department of the National Farmers Organization. Gene, most producers pretty well accept the fact that NFO has been a prime influence it's in much higher than expected hog prices, but what about cattle? Well, Bill, uh, we have been involved in a cattle bargaining program that we call marketing arrangements uh, since 1966. The actual uh, finalization of the program uh, after we'd gone through the trial periods actually started in 67 to 1968 when following the 1968 holding action we were able to get our first real written contracts uh, in cattle. Since that time we have continued to be able to make progress uh, in updating the contracts, improving the benefits to the members under the contracts and also increasing or the producers accepting increasing responsibility uh, whereby the packer could afford to pay a higher price to the producer and thus mm -hmm. develop a program which is mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. Now among the benefits to the members, I know that uh, you are most pleased with the accomplishments of uh, NFO representatives in packing plants across the country. Bill, this is really the heart of uh, any bargaining program particularly for the protection of the membership that participate in that program. You can develop uh, formulas and contracts that will return the producer a fair price, but unless someone is there to see that his interests, interests are protected in grading, uh, the weighing of the carcasses, the determination of any damage that might be on the carcass, uh, he has to be represented by a trained, competent individual mm -hmm. in a plant. Well, a trained, competent individual indeed is Lester Carr, as you know, at the Dugdale Packing right. Company in St. Joseph. In fact, on a former U.S. Uh, Farm Report show, Lester uh, was featured, and we learned from Lester just exactly in detail what he does as the NFO representative there. On today's show, uh, I am very happy to say that we're going to repeat at least a portion of that interview with Lester knowing that uh, a lot of people are looking in today who perhaps missed Lester Carr on the show on which he was featured. So we will go to the Dugdale packing plant in St. Joseph, Missouri for that interview a little bit later on. Well, as that's right, Bill. And as I was uh, talking about a pricing formula, uh, it's one of Lester's jobs, which I'm sure he'll mention uh, in this uh, discussion, is not only to see that the proper grading is done, that the cattle are handled properly in the plant, but also to check the returns that go to the producer to see that uh, they have been paid the uh, price mm -hmm. that they should have been mm -hmm. under the contract. Well, Gene, in cattle, like in all other farm commodities, price is still the name of the game. Now, last summer, for example, we had a pretty fair uh, cattle price, a pretty good, uh, pretty good price coming in. That's right. In the meantime, that price has gone down. Do you feel that cattle producers missed an opportunity there in not being able to maintain that price level of last summer? Yes, Bill. Uh, in one sense, I very definitely do. Uh, I think that, uh, as you've mentioned, you can see a substantial difference between cattle price levels and hog price levels in the relative stability of the two. Mm -hmm. That you've had a widely fluctuating cattle market in the last few months and a very stable hog market. And uh, the outside factors affecting the two, uh, according to the supplies that were available and such, there really wasn't a substantial justification for this. So I do think that, that the producers have really missed an opportunity because uh, back in July, when we had $55 choice uh, steer carcass meat, uh, we had many contracts that contained a floor price concept. And had uh, producers accepted the responsibility and moved this program as rapidly as they could have, I feel we could have had substantially higher prices than what we do have. But although we can say that there are things that we would uh, like to do, uh, I still feel there has been a terrific effect, and I'd like to show you something for a moment here. And this uh, is a, as you can see, a bar graph uh, comparing prices. And you see here on your left the 
uh, relative price in the Missouri Valley area, which is a heavy cattle feeding area, and all areas moved approximately the same as this, the price below the Chicago FOB delivered price was approximately 75 cents prior to 1968. But today, the present, the price in this level is running a dollar and 25 cents above the Chicago mm -hmm. price. So a relative improvement of two dollars a hundredweight for cattle producers. And this is not only true in the Missouri Valley area, Bill, but over the entire cattle feeding area where our members are participating in a bargaining program. So although there are many things that could have been gained in price. Uh, the members are having the protection of that contractual formula, the man in the plant, plus they have been able to improve their prices $2 per hundredweight, and on an average uh, size steer carcass or heifer, this is 12 to $15 per head. So this in itself is a substantial gain. Well, of course, Gene, the cattle feeder is having his problems. Now, what must he do to solve those problems? Bill, first of all, uh, he must use his production. He must block his produ production together and use it in an organized manner to gain the goals that he sets for himself. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like any bargaining program, and we've discussed with regard to NFO many times, that it does no good to talk about doing something. You must put your production together, and the power you have is that production. Uh, this is the only way that it can be done. And Yes, you're right. Uh, the cattle feeder is in real problems, and it's been reported to us and uh, observing the cattle markets, uh, what our members are telling us, that uh, cattle feeders are losing from 30 to $50 a head in many instances right now. Uh, this is a result of higher grain prices, and many of the grain producers have blocked their production together and had an effect on raising the price. It's a result of higher feeder cattle prices, the cattle that the, per, the uh, feeder puts in his lot to finish for market. Uh, this has been a result to a great degree of the ranchers blocking their mm -hmm. calves together and raising the feeder cattle market. So the beef feeder, the man who feeds cattle for market, must do something or he's going to face a financial disaster. I understand that there's another factor in his uh, dilemma and we might call it a social factor. I'm talking about the social relationship between so many cattle producers and the people to whom they sell. These people oftentimes are very close friends, aren't they? That's and right. know, they know each other socially and their families intermingle. Right. What uh, doesn't this contribute to, uh, to a worsening of the price situation somewhat? It, yes, it does, Bill, and uh, I hesitate to uh, to really discuss this, uh, possibly, because we're not opposed to uh, producers uh, having a uh, good relationship with the people that buy his no, production. Naturally but, not. Uh, no. It has gone to the point, in many instances, that the cattle feeder himself uh, is afraid to use his production to better his own business interest for fear of, of making uh, the buyer mad or harming a social relationship that they have. And this goes back to part of uh, uh, what I mentioned earlier, that the cattle feeder is going to have to use his cattle uh, to gain a higher price. And if that means selling them uh, through a bargaining program to a company that the friend, uh, his friend happens to be buying for a different company, but selling them to someone that his friend's not buying for in order to move the program forward, and then it's going to be necessary. And uh, the business aspect of bargaining and marketing the cattle, it must come before social relationships if the cattle feeder is going to make the gains that his economic situation dictate if he's going to stay in business. Gene, you've indicated the necessity for this cattle producer we're talking about to move his cattle. Now, why not uh, get into some kind of a program with his friend who is the buyer? Well, Bill, uh, this is a very... Uh, could be a very involved uh, discussion uh, with regard to the philosophy of bargaining. But very simply, it amounts to this, that uh, if every producer uh, was to maintain the same outlets that he had in the past, then there would be no change in the uh, movement of production, that the patterns would remain the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, to apply bargaining pressure, a change must be made uh, somewhere along the line you must move production 
to an outlet that it wasn't being moved to before so that the people that lost the production then uh, need something they don't have. And in doing that, uh, they tend to raise the price in an attempt to get that. And if raising the price doesn't do it, then they're willing to make bargaining concessions and sign contracts. So uh, you, you can get it down to a matter, say, there's only three plants in the United States. And one of these plants happened to be represented by the friendly buyer we're talking about. And that uh, it's possible that this could be the plant that the program would be developed with. But if this plant refuses to sign a contract which grants the benefits that the producers uh, can attain and deserve, then you may have to go to one of the other two plants. And uh, if the other plant then signs an agreement which grants these benefits, it's going to be necessary for the members uh, of the organization and of this block we're talking about to take their production from the markets that it used to be and put it into the new channel under the contract in the block bargaining program. Gene, what are the direct operational benefits to NFO members uh, who sell through NFO? Well, Bill, I believe the card that uh, we showed a while ago comparing the actual prices producers receive as opposed to a Chicago market, shows some real benefits. But of course, these benefits, uh, most everybody is profiting from, whether they're members of our organization or whether they're not. So I imagine you're talking about the benefits that NFO members receive as opposed to someone who is not a member of his organization. That's correct. Uh, marketing cattle. Well, first of all, uh, I have mentioned a pricing formula contained in these contracts. Well, the pricing formula itself takes into consideration uh, a national market or the general price level for cattle, uh, which is based and determined by the national provisioner, which is quoted in Chicago. But in addition to that, the regional price is to ta taken into consideration uh, because there are various prices uh, in various regions or various differences from the Chicago market based on where the location of the cattle are. And finally, all of the contracts call for the uh, fact that if the packer with whom the members are under contract to is required to pay a price to a non-member which is higher than the price under our contract, then he must also pay that price for NFO cattle. Yes. So this means then that the producer is protected uh, from the standpoint of the national, the regional, and the local market price. He always receives at least as much as the local market and in instances more. And this of course is justified because of the services that he is performing in supplying mm -hmm. this packer uh, with cattle. There are attempts made by buyers to cause uh, a, a member who is a part of this block of production to sell his production somewhere else. And this can take many forms, but a great many times it's uh, a bid, a price that may or may not be there, but uh, a hypothetical bid that in many cases is something over the market uh, in an attempt to cause those who are part of that block moving this program forward to become dissatisfied. There's no doubt that at times this does happen, but those who are involved must remember that a quarter today can easily cost them many dollars tomorrow. Now, there have been an awful lot of people talking about livestock marketing and uh, uh, in particular cattle marketing with regard to a grade and weight selling program, so-called experts, uh, market reporters that discuss this type of a marketing program. You'll find that many times these people have very little actual experience in this end of the business and very little or no, no actual technical training. So uh, the so-called experts in the past many times have been talking about things that they really were not in a position to authentically discuss. As far as NFO's bargaining program is concerned, our members have the benefit of the opportunity to come to the plant, see their cattle, uh, see them handled, and see that their interests are protected. And in fact, uh, this is encouraged. The representative at the plant is there to assist these people when they come in, show them around, and make them uh, feel welcome and know where to go to see what they would like to see. fact of the matter is, uh, Gene, uh, at this point in today's show, 
Why don't we invite uh, all of our viewers to meet an NFO representative at the Dugdale Packing Plant in St. Joseph, Missouri, Mr. Lester Carr. Hello, everybody. We're greeting you today from the Dugdale Packing Plant here in St. Joseph, Missouri. Dugdale Packing Company is one of the largest independent packers in the whole country. Fact of the matter is, uh, this plant is a growing plant, and I'm sure that NFO production is partly responsible for that because we're sitting here to show you something of its growth on uh, the edge of some new cattle pens that are being built here to handle the uh, influx of NFO cattle as well as cattle from other sources. With me today is my old friend, Mr. Lester Carr, who is NFO packing plant representative. Les and I have known each other for a number of years. Les has been a farmer around this part of Missouri for perhaps longer than he'd like to admit. Les, right. how <laughs> many acres are you farming uh, now? 225. Well, are you able to uh, hold down this important role here and still uh, run your farm without help, or do you hire people? I hire you? some on the, uh, the specified time, see, like putting up hay and yeah. putting in some crops, but I do the most of it myself on the weekends and like of that, see. Right and still come down here and spend the day here at Dugdale's. Now, Les, you have a specialized job here representing NFO members at this packing plant. I presume that you have counterparts all over the country doing the same thing. Yes, we do have in the United States. Yes, we're set up in several different plants. Well, now, could you tell us in a detailed manner, step by step, exactly what you do here? Well. My, I'm representing the, the National Farmers Organization. I uh, book cattle for the members to be delivered at the plant at a specified time. Uh, first, the member in each county uh, calls the county bargaining supervisor and tells them well, how many cattle and what time he wants to deliver. And in turn, then the county bargaining supervisor calls me uh, a day ahead of time when these cattle are supposed to arrive, see? And uh, I book them up. And then, in turn, I uh, contact uh, the boy at the, the dock where they're being unloaded, and we book them up that way. So we keep an even flow of cattle coming to the plant, mm -hmm. which is a great service to a packer, him knowing exactly how many cattle he's going to have on the kill. Right, right. Well, so you can anticipate the, uh, the influx in here at any given time. Right. For uh, example, I, today, you know exactly how many cattle are coming in here tomorrow. Right, right. That's right. Well, now, you follow these cattle, Les, as I understand it, uh, from the time the truck backs in here and unloads on to the killing floor and through the entire process. Right. Would you tell us about some of your duties uh, in these areas? Well, I watch them unload the cattle and uh, see if they're not uh, crowding them and causing them to get bruises, see. Cattle can be bruised when they're unloaded around out the end of the trucks, you know, the end gate. And, uh, and this is very costly. Well, bruises mean a loss of, uh, of income because right. uh, it downgrades the, the beef. And, uh, and the NFO farmer simply uh, isn't making the money that he would otherwise. Right. right. So we, we, we were very particular about the cattle here on the unloading operation as they go from, from the truck into the scale to be weighed live and then put in the pans and uh, then later on after they've rested we'd run them on the kill and now you said the key word uh, rested right as i understand it uh, cattle in the process of being trucked and herded into a place like dugdale uh, get nervous mm -hmm. and this can really affect the grade can't it that's right what uh, do you do about that les well what uh, what we do is uh, pen the cattle and uh, let them rest, uh, let's say, three or four hours, such a matter, maybe longer. Uh, depends on the cattle. If they're, you can tell by looking at them, if they're nervous. And nervous cattle uh, just will not uh, bleed out properly. And this all affects the uh, grading cattle because cattle are graded on the color of the meat as well as the amount of marbling in the loin eye. Okay, at that point, then, you follow them right onto the kill floor. Tell us about that. 
Right, and uh, I see if they're, if they're booked up properly uh, to go on the kill at a, at a certain time. And, uh, and by the way, all cattle are killed in lot numbers, like if a man brought 20 head of, of cattle in here, and uh, they're booked up, 20's gonna follow 10 ahead of them, and then maybe 15's gonna be behind that, and that way we keep them separate so those cattle will not get mixed up. The only thing that will get cattle mixed up at this plant is the farmer or the uh, trucker that brings them in usually, he has picked up Sam Jones's or somebody's cattle, and he went over here and got uh, some from somebody else, and see, and and uh, he gets here at the plant, he unloads, and he says, well, I think those belong to so-and-so Sam Jones, and, yeah. but he's not too sure, right. see? So he gets them mixed up telling the boy on the dock whose cattle's what. So there's a, there's the problem right there on a mixed-up load, but whenever they are identified properly, they go through here in a lot number, and... Uh, that is one thing that we're watching very particular. Now you, uh, on the kill floor, and following uh, following the beef then on through, uh, you work with, or at least you have an opportunity to observe and talk with government inspectors. Right. Uh, the, they have uh, federal meat inspectors in this plant, and uh, they inspect every half a beef as it comes down, or every beef carcass in the plant and I can be in there and watch them and see uh, what they're designated as a bruise to be cut off and question them on it see and uh, therefore uh, you know you could argue with them but to a certain extent on it. Now as I understand it in this matter of grading uh, you have the privilege of, uh, of asking the grading people to wait to grade uh, some beef. In other words, if, if, if you feel that by waiting a few hours, uh, beef will get a better grade, you have the privilege to bring that about. Is this correct? Right. You see, cattle that's being killed today would be graded tomorrow. So therefore, they would cool out approximately 24 hours. And when the grader starts of the morning grading cattle, why, maybe they're not properly cool. You can tell by feeling of the beef whether it's firm enough and what uh, what is the process is going on here is the uh, cooling out of the uh, of the fat in other words so as it will show up and in other words they call it marbling in the in the loin eye in the muscular lean so when that's cooled out properly why it'll all show up so uh, the standard set up by the grader uh, department they go by this to determine what grade it's going to be. So therefore, if uh, we would wait, uh, let's say, um, the grader was here grading uh, like in the morning, say eight, nine o'clock, and those cattle are not properly cooled out yet, well, we wait till say two to three o'clock this afternoon to give a final grade on, which might up the grade, which does a lot of times. Here we go again. Here we go again. And a couple they, of bucks uh, right. uh, here and there. So as you were saying a while ago, yes, a 600 it, pound steer, that'd be $12. And a $2 difference in right. the good from a choice. Right. So that would mean quite a bit on a hundred head of cattle. Well now, how is the price Doug Dale pays for NFO cattle determined? Uh, we got a pricing formula uh, arrangement set up with the Dugdale Packing Company and uh, on a great yield basis off of the uh, yellow sheet price, which is dressed meat market, see? Yes. So it's determined off of this. Les, are you sure that uh, NFO members are getting this price? Yes, I am certain because uh, I have uh, Mr. Dugdale's uh, secretaries give me a copy of everybody's uh, great yield sheet, which I have right here. So I take these sheets every day, and I have the copy of the yellow sheet, and I check the price on the sheet here according to what the yellow sheet uh -huh. and the grid bond price is. Well, now, would you list some of the advantages of selling on this basis? Well, uh, as the cattle go through the plant, they go through on individual merits. If a man brings in 20 steers, let's say, and uh, here goes one, number one through, and uh, he's a choice steer. Well, that's what he's going to be because uh, uh, the government man's doing the grading. Strictly government. It's nothing that Dugdale has anything to do with. It. Yeah. Right. And so, therefore, uh, this would mean dollars and cents in the pocket. 
book, well, see? So if you're buying them on foot, there's, uh, there's more guesswork that way because the, the, if I was buying cattle, in which the buyers do too, I would want to guess lower, so I would come out on the great yield, which is the way they all wind up. There's no eye determination, no guesswork involved in it. Right. Well, that makes for, for a good system, right. I would say. Do you uh, represent here at Dugdale uh, any uh, members that are, or rather any farmers that are not NFO members? No, I cannot. Gene, it seems to me the job that Lester Carr and his counterparts all across the country are doing are jobs that uh, necessitate some training. Do they get it from NFO? This is right, Bill. Uh, training of these people is very important, and I feel we've been very fortunate to have a man come uh, with us in the last few months that has had a great deal of experience and background in carcass training, evaluation, and plant operations to assist us in this training program. He works in instructions with the plant people, actually working right there in the plant with them on the job training. So we are doing a great deal to train these people to do their job. Well, Gene, his name is Andy Knightsling, and uh, Andy will be featured on U.S. Farm Report next week. That's right. Uh, when the title of our show will be NFO's Cattle Bargaining Program, Part 2. Andy, in fact, uh, will take us into the cooler rooms at Dugdale Packing Plant in St. Joseph, Missouri, uh, where we all will deal with quality grading of beef cattle and the handling of carcasses to benefit the producer. I hope that you'll be looking in next week at this same time. Our guest today has been Gene Potter. Gene, thank you for being with us. Gene is the director of the Meat Commodity Department of the National Farmers Organization. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week at this same time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody.